Today I'll be talking about a project that I'm in the middle of right now, and I'm working at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Geography with someone called Brian Klinkenberg. He's my supervisor, uh, and he is a biogeographer. So a lot of what we do in our lab works with GIS, Geographic Information Systems, and Remote Sensing to try to map different things. Um, and so in my case, I'm mapping Cryptococcus gadii in collaboration with the BC Centers for Disease Control, so Lenny Galanis, Sunny Mack, and others. Um, and so what I'm going to present to you today is uh, kind of an investigation into the 1999 Vancouver Island outbreak of Cryptococcus gadii, which uh, probably many of you remember. And given the time that we have, I'll do my best to go through what we have done so far. Um, and so it is a spatiotemporal analysis that I'm attempting to do. Um, but before I get into that, it's important to go over what Cryptococcus gadii is and, and why we need to, to care about it. So Cryptococcus gadii, uh, for those of you who may not have heard of it before, is a microscopic fungus. You cannot see it with the naked eye. And it, is, uh, it can be pathogenic. So when taken up into the lungs, uh, the spores can uh, cause a variety of symptoms in a disease called cryptococcosis. And this can cause, in this case with this cat, skin lesions. Um, it can also uh, grow in the lungs and cause difficulty breathing and other complications. It can also get into the central nervous system and into the brain. Uh, it can cause fatalities as well. We have seen those. Um, and it is a relatively rare disease. The first question I'm always asked at conferences is how do you avoid getting it? It's almost impossible to avoid. It's one of those annoying diseases where, you know, how do you avoid a microscopic fungus and how do you avoid inhaling it? You just don't breathe, which is not something you can tell people to do. So it has infected a lot of animals and it infects humans as well. Uh, lots of cat cases, dog cases. We've seen porpoises on the beach that have had it, uh, horses and so on. Um, and so usually when I give these talks, people are interested in human health side of this. Um, and so this is just an example of it in, in the human lungs. Um, but what was particularly uh, interesting about this fungus with the 1999 outbreak was that this was largely unexpected um, to find this fungus in Canada. So this was the first outbreak of gadii that we've, that we've got on record in Canada. And prior to that outbreak, the fungus was largely believed to be a tropical and subtropical pathogen. Um, and so now that we've got it here, this is an older map, but it's still a very good one uh, to use because it shows the general pattern that we're seeing when we try to map this, this fungus. So it's largely on the eastern side of Vancouver Island. There are almost no cases on the western side. In this map, you can see one porpoise case on the west there. Where am I clicker? I have shaky hands, so it might not work. Yeah, right there. Um, but for the purposes of GIS, I don't count porpoise cases because where the porpoise goes and dies is not necessarily where it actually picked up the pathogen. And so there's a lot of questions that are raised uh, when, we've, when we've seen this outbreak. And so I, the overarching question for my thesis is looking at climate changes, and this includes climatic oscillations in general, and land cover change, and which may have played a, a greater role in the 1999 uh, emergence of C. gadii on Vancouver Island. At this rate, I'm not really all that interested in which one's bigger or more important than the other. I just want to see, is there any link at all? <laughs> so finding any link right now would be really exciting. Um, and so today's focus is on land cover change and deforestation. And so this is a great picture uh, to show how bad deforestation can look from the air. And when we're doing mapping, this is, this is largely, um, well, this is aerial photography, but this is largely what it can look like. And it's important to discuss why we're interested in deforestation. Because when I started this project, I never thought of deforestation. I was looking at construction. I knew that ecological disturbance in some way may be linked to C. gadii. Um, but I picked deforestation as the variable because gadii grows in soil and it grows on trees. And we do know that. Uh, when you disturb the soil and when you chop down trees, particularly if you're chipping them, and it, they have been colonized by the fungus, this has been shown to increase the number of spores that get into the air which may increase the risk of infection. And so we're trying to find that link using GIS uh, to see if that's actually what was happening. Was there some significant deforestation event prior to 1999 that might have helped this fungus along? And so for this project, I'm asking, are there spatiotemporal correlations, so relationships in space and time, between where we've detected Cryptococcus gadii and where there have been deforestation events? And this is really a perfect question for GIS if you have the data for it. Um, and so this is where the spatiotemporal analysis comes in. 
And this is where my lab mate, Peter Whitman, comes in. And I always make sure to mention his name when I give these talks because I beg him to come to talks and he never comes. Um, but he needs to be here and get full credit. So I'll try to think of something embarrassing about him to say at some point. But he is the, 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 the mind behind creating the spatiotemporal analysis. And he and I have been building this from previous studies that have done similar things. So just a quick kind of overview of what we're doing. This is called the Ripley's K function. This is kind of step one of the process that we're doing and that we're building on. So when you're doing mapping, you can look at clustering of points in space. And so Ripley's K is, is one way of doing that. And so in this case, if you imagine these blue points as cryptococcus scadii cases in space, um, you can determine using this function how well, how closely those points are related to each other. Are they dispersed? Are they kind of just random? Uh, or are they clustered together? If you want to go a step further, you would use something called the Ripley's cross correlation, or cross K function, where now you're relating two variables in space to each other. This has a point to this. Um, so in this case, if you're interested in deforestation, where a deforestation event has taken place in relation to Cryptococcus gadii, you can do something like this. But again, this is just in space. And I also really want to look at time. And so this is where Peter comes in, and this is where Heather Lynch comes in. So Heather Lynch is a professor at Stony Brook University. She's been a big help to us because she created this methodology where you're basically taking the Ripley's cross K and you're just extending it through time. So now you're looking at all these complex relationships and the space-time interaction between where deforestation events are taking place prior to an event, in this case, there's a directionality to it, that's why the fungus point is at the top there. Um, and you're looking from the point where you've detected the fungus back in time, and you're trying to see in space and time, is there a relationship? So I also want to give credit to Heather Lynch because she's created this methodology. Peter and I have taken it a step further because we have this incredible data set I'm about to show you for deforestation, um, which actually gives us magnitude. It actually gives us the size and the shape of the deforestation events. And so that would allow us to actually account for, the, for magnitude of deforestation as well as where it actually is. So this is Heather Lynch's equation. Um, I tend to get gasps when I show it on a slide. So I, and, and I'm not saying that people don't understand it, it's just, it looks a little overwhelming when you see it. It's actually, all it's saying is, we're interested in calculating intensity of deforestation, which is on the left there. And all we're trying to say in this equation, which is what Heather Lynch has created, is we're interested in that top left pure space-time correlation. And so when you're dealing with GIS, sometimes you'll have pure spatial correlation issues and purely temporal ones. And all this equation is doing is, is controlling for that. But I thought it's important to include that equation. I don't have a clock on here, that's why. Okay. So this is what our deforestation data set looks like. I got this from the UBC Forestry Department from Drs. Choman Hermosula and Mike Walder, um, amongst many others who I'm forgetting their names right now. Uh, but they have created this, this data set which is basically, if you don't know what a raster is, it's kind of clusters of points um, or shapes where we know where deforestation has taken place. We know the size of the deforestation event and we know the date of the deforestation event. We only, we only know the year. We don't know the month or the day that the trees were cut. That's a little too crazy. But once we have this, and, and this ranges from 1985 to 2011, we can now overlay our Cryptococcus gadii points. So this is just showing an example of, what the, of the methodology that Peter has developed. Um, and so, and this is also playing on what Heather Lynch did. So in Heather Lynch's paper, she related budworm events to fires. And this is very similar to us. We're just taking, instead of budworms, we've got Cryptococcus gadii. Instead of fires, we have deforestation events, same thing. And so you take these points, and I wanted to consider all of the locations anywhere around Cryptococcus gadii. So it didn't matter what direction it was coming from. We can't account for wind. We don't have that kind of data. And so buffering is the best way to do this in GIS. And so we created these, what are called multi-ring buffers. So that way we can calculate the intensity of deforestation that's happening as you move away from the fungal event. And we can also calculate the timing at which this deforestation event took place. So in this case, these are buffers at one kilometer, um, sp uh, one kilometer radii. And this is just an example at 10 kilometers. I've actually extended this up to 30 kilometers just to see how far I could push the computer power. We then collect, we have to clip for water. A lot of the sea cases are along kind of the edge of eastern Vancouver Island, so we can't include the areas in the water. 
And then we do a very simple calculation. We just do an overlay and we calculate the area of deforestation by the area of the clipped ring. So now we're, we're kind of normalizing for the areas of the rings. And now we're calculating as you move away in distance uh, where deforestation events taking place, what's the magnitude of that, um, and when did it occur. This is where I tend to lose people. So if you have questions during the discussion, it's, it's not because it's overly complex. I just don't think I'm, oh, it's, it's hard to visualize in R what we're doing. But what we're doing is we're taking that information and we're averaging it across all the points. So that's where you have on the left here, you kind of have zero. Zero means on the average point, at zero distance and zero time, you've got your fungal event. As you move back in time, which is why we're calling it lag years, and as you move away from the fungal point in distance, you create a matrix. And for every single matrix cell, you have a deforestation intensity value. For the null, we have to compare this to something in order to actually have any kind of statistically significant result. And so what I tried to do using Heather Lynch's models, I suggested, why don't we take that observed matrix and move around, basically shuffle randomly the labels of the years and the labels of the, uh, of the distances to throw off any kind of spatiotemporal links that there might be. Do this 9,999 times, and it'll give you a frequency distribution that you can compare the observed to. This is not ideal, this is not the best way to do it, but it is a good first start. So this is what we did, and we've started getting some results, and I will talk about these uh, very carefully because these are not final results, um, but they're showing something quite surprising. And so sometimes when I show these, people don't know where to look, and I, I don't blame you at all because it's a little bit, uh, there's a lot going on. I'm interested in this area in particular. Uh, I'm interested in the whole thing, but that area here is kind of where you're at point zero, and I would expect this to be, when I first started this, I thought this might be bright red because I'm hoping to find a link where deforestation events must be really, really bad close to all these places where people are getting sick. And that's actually not what we're finding at all. We're finding the opposite. We're finding blue. These are Z scores. So these are what blue means in this case is that we're actually seeing less intense deforestation close to where people are getting sick than we would expect. Uh, and so I had to think about this for a while and I went, oh no, my PhD is over. Um, but this has to keep going. And this is using different combinations of environmental and animal data. And no matter how I did it, I used different subsets. Environmental data, by the way, is soil and swab samples. Um, animal data would be cat samples and uh, ferret samples. And the reason we selected these and got rid of the, the horses and the, and the dogs was because horses and dogs tend to travel quite a bit. And I don't have as much confidence in their GPS coordinate. Whereas cats and ferrets, unless you take your cat hiking with you, which most people don't, I can be confident that that coordinate uh, at the residence location is, is reliable. Oh, perfect. OK, great. Um, and so no matter how I did this, we got similar plots. Not exactly the same, but very, very similar. And you'll also notice that deforestation tends to increase as you move away in distance. So as you're looking on that y-axis, we're actually seeing deforestation generally go up. Um, but when you're very close in distance, just along the bottom of this, it's often very blue. And when we thought about this a little bit more, I realized, well, wait a second. Most of the locations where we have points are close to people's houses in urban areas. There's not a lot of deforestation in mass numbers near urban areas because they've already cut all the trees down and destroyed the environment. Um, and people are now living there. And so if there is a link, this might not be the best size of the buffers to look at this at. This might be a more local scale problem. And so that's why I'm saying this is just beginning to kind of preliminary results coming in. These results actually do make sense. When you think of the island, if you, if you live there or you're from there, there are tiny little deforestation events happening in the city, but usually not massive ones. Um, and so this just kind of lines them up so that you can see them. But there's a lot still left to do and a lot still left to play with. Um, and so for what's next, um, the null model that we've created was created from the observed data set. And this has some problems when we've read about this in the literature. It would be best to actually take background points because we don't have true negatives um, and run these models again. And if we're seeing the same thing, then maybe we actually don't have any kind of link at all uh, with deforestation. But again, we have to vary the size of the distance bands. We're working with 30 kilometers. I think that's too big. That's why we're seeing these massive increases in deforestation, because as you move away from where people live, you're moving into the more rural environments where there is more deforestation. And that might have biologically nothing to do with GADII. 
Um, I've also only done this so far with environmental and animal cases. I haven't yet done it with the human ones. And so that's the next thing to do as well. So is that, yeah. So thank you to everyone here. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Emily. We're uh, tight for time, so we're going to hold questions to the end of the session. So uh, just jot down your questions for Emily, and she can answer.